Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 124. I think I got that right. It's Friday. We're all brain dead. So it's not going to really matter anyway. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today, September 26th, 2004. It's Friday. It's lighthearted news day. Why? Well, the only news we could find is lightheartedness. We talked about such hard issues this week. We talked on Monday about the soul of the Anglican Communion. On Wednesday, we talked about remarriage in the Roman Catholic Church. We're going to move on now and talk about global climate change. Really? Yeah, really. Um, not because George and I want to, but because the Episcopal Church has forced us to. What? No, they're not letting off carbon. Yes, they are letting off carbon. Well, we'll get to that. Um, Catherine Jeffords Shorey, the head of the Lutheran Church in America, the head of the Lutheran Church in Canada, and the head of the Anglican Church of Canada, put out a press release this week saying, we support the upcoming march on global climate change. Damn those humans that God created for affecting human-based uh, cl uh, climate change, and we need to repent of human climate change. George, that's great. The, it's nice to see that our uh, presiding bishop has a voice in this game, but sometimes the Episcopal Church accidentally causes what we call um, oopses. <laughs> Self-inflicted injuries. Yes. So let's talk about the hypocrisy here, George. Yes. Well, on the House of, Pres House of Deputies, House of Bishops listserv, which is a discussion group for members of the General Convention, this past week there was concern that the Episcopal Church would look, look profligate spending a lot of money to fly 100 plus bishops and their wives and husbands and domestic partners halfway around the world. And that would look bad because it would show that we just have money to burn. Well, this statement from Catherine Jeffrey Shorey and the other church leaders came out while she was in Taiwan. And it doesn't look bad about the money issue. What looks bad is that you fly halfway around the world on jumbo jets and then criticize people for using carbons. You're one of the villains in this piece, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey. It is interesting. And then, yeah, go on. And then to go on to say that you need to, you know, support those protesters. You know, Kevin, frankly, if I wanted to to learn my theology from weird beard, pacifist, socialist, vegetarian sandal wearers with bad oral hygiene, I would be a fan of Rowan Williams. <laughs> I would not look to these Occupy Wall Street types that are infesting the city of new york these days yeah and george and i are not here to argue the science or uh or that it's to discuss the hypocrisy um when we're watching the video coverage of this um you see leonardo dicaprio who owns one of the biggest yachts in the world uh talk about uh climate change you watch uh um, Al Gore, who has one of the largest houses in Tennessee, um, would pay you know two three thousand dollars a month on his electric bill. Um, it's just we, we want to be sure that people understand. It's great to speak out for these things, but you got to walk the walk and talk the talk. And the Episcopal Church, uh, by participating in this, ha has to understand that nobody's watching anymore, George. Nobody cared. Walter Russell Mead, who was a very influential columnist and foreign policy analyst, whose father, by the way, was Lauren C. Mead, the founder of the Alban Institute in Washington, D.C., which hardcore Episcopalians will know very well. Uh, Walter Russell Mead uh, wrote an article a year or two back just lambasting the House of Bishops and presiding Bishop Jeffrey Shorey for taking a position on every issue that came down the pike gun control, immigration, global warming, so on and so forth. And Walter Russell Mead, who is a political liberal, who is a liberal Episcopalian in his doctrinal beliefs, and he attends a church in Brooklyn, he said, just be quiet. Nobody is listening, and the more you talk, the less effective your voice becomes. Let me just... Now, people say, well, shouldn't churches be making involved in the, in the political life of the country? Well, in the Episcopal Church, the canons forbade it mm -hmm. for the first hundred plus years. Yep. We did not split over the Civil War, for instance, because we did not talk, the bishops were not supposed to talk about politics because the Episcopal Church was a national church who had people from South Carolina 
to Massachusetts, who were across all the political spectrums of that day and age, uh, Federalists and Republicans and... Whig party people, the, yes. The, the, the church had adopted an attitude that we must respect the polit politics of all of our members, but we need to focus on Jesus Christ and allow people to take from these teachings uh, things that will influence their political life. But for a bishop to get up and tell you what is right and wrong in a political sphere, that is wrong. Now that lasted well up until the end of the 19th century. And it totally disappeared in the civil rights movement. Now once the door was open for the civil rights movement, bishops could get on any bandwagon they choose. And now we have bishops. Oh, there was a silly thing the other day where the Bishop of Atlanta spoke to the Religion News Writers Association and said Jesus would not be a member of the NRA. Well, you know, that's like, that's like uh, Elton John saying Jesus, were he alive today, would back gay marriage. You know, just think about the, the mindset of people saying Jesus would not be a member of the NRA. Now, Moses was. Remember, well, yeah, Charlton yeah, Heston yeah. was president. <laughs> But, you know, the, the church, the more you talk and the, and the less of what you say, and, and, it, and it loses importance, you know. Oh, Kevin, what are we going to do? <laughs> well, I mean, these are important points. Yeah, the, the church is supposed to have a voice in society. Uh, it just isn't supposed to be the uh, always voice of, uh, well, the problem with the Episcopal Church is not that it's a voice of society. It is the voice of the society. It's not like there's not a lot of disagreement between society and the Episcopal Church. Um, and I guess that's the bigger problem. When, when, you're no long, when you're no better than the local bar, why would you, well, people go there? And also, to me, it's one of the most intensely frustrating things. That mm -hmm. The change we've seen over the past two generations, with all these non-Episcopalians joining our church because they love our liturgy or whatever, or they've been divorced and they can't go back to the Catholic Church, is they forget it is the laity that is to speak on these issues in the public arena, not the bishops, not the clergy. We have our jobs, our charisms, our ministries. And every time a bishop of Washington gets up at a Democratic National Convention wearing her collar and blessing the candidates, that's offensive to the Episcopal understanding of the break between church and state. We're not the Church of England. The polit I, we, we encourage our people, our members, to be politically active, but not wearing collars and claiming the mantle of an authority that's offensive to take upon ourselves when it's not ours. I, I feel strongly about this, Apparently. Kevin. Do you think so? Yeah, and I, listen, as we close out here, if you want to be like culture, you're not going to smell any better than the local bar. 